Good evening. <laughs> Call and response. No, I'm kidding. Um, it's really, really, it's thrilling, truly, to see you all here. Um, and to be together in person. It's been two years since we were able to do that um, for this organization, and we're just de delighted. Um, welcome, everyone, to English in Action's 2021 Summer Benefit. My name is Julie Cummins. Woo! I co-chair the board of directors of English in Action with my colleague, Susan Lodge. Susan, give a wave. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. I've also been a volunteer tutor uh, since 2017 to a wonderful woman from Indonesia, Sinta, where are you? who I am, I am truly privileged to now call my friend. It's my great pleasure to be your MC for the evening alongside my fellow English in Action board member, Estela Lopez. Some of you, some of you may remember Estela from um, 2019 when we were at the Hotel Jerome and she was our student speaker and she shared her beautiful and moving personal journey. We are now so delighted to have Estella serving on our board. Buenas noches, amigos. My name is Estela Lopez, and I joined English in Action in 2007. 14 years ago, I was a beginner English speaker, and I was becoming accustomed to living in the United States. Many things have changed. Now, my tutor, Polly Polar, she's not here right now, but she's one of my best friends. Uh, I have been given the opportunity to start my own business as a personal trainer, and my husband and I took our daughter for, to Fort Collins for college, and I am so happy for her. <laughs> Recently, I am a tutor and a student representative on the board of directors at English in Action. I am so proud to be part of this great, great and fantastic organization. English in Action helped help me a lot. And it, it has done so much to help me and hundreds of other immigrants to succeed in the United States. As we begin our program, we'd like to recognize that tonight is the second night of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, a time of reflection and prayer. Regardless of your faith, honoring the sacred seems more important than ever, especially as so many are still suffering the impacts of COVID-19. So please know that we, we, we wish you all a safe, healthy, and happy New Year. Here, here. And before we continue, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the many people who made this event possible. First and foremost, tonight's underwriters. Um, incredibly generous and truly, we would not be here in this beautiful space with all of you without their support. They're, this fundraiser is critical to making our work possible over the next year and, um, and we're so grateful for all of you. Our underwriters are, and please hold your applause, uh, Issa Caddo and Daniel Shaw, I know you're here somewhere, uh, Jessica and John Fullerton, Jody Guralnik and Michael Lipkin, the Melville family, Jill Sofer and Steve Elder, and Susan Taylor and Rob Pugh. Now, please join me in a big round of applause. We would also like to recognize our fabulous sponsors. Again, please hold your applause. Alpine Bank, Alpine Valley Services, Aspen Public Radio, Aspen Snoma Sotheby's and Susan Guggenheim Lodge, The Aspen Times, Herriman Construction, 
Nancy Magoon, Obermeyer Wood Investment Council, Kelly and Mark Purnell, Rhys Henry and Company, Thurston Kitchen and Bath, and Umbrella Ruffin. Please, let's give them a round of applause. Yay! Additionally, additionally, and we will get to our main program, I promise. Um, we'd like to thank the 13 individuals and couples who served as hosts for this benefit. Hosts, give a wave, raise your hand, don't be shy. Really, we're so, thank you, thank you all. Also, yay! Please raise your hand if you are on the English and Action Board of Directors, Advisory Council, and or if you are a tutor or student. Th thank you all so much. You make this possible. You change lives, I promise you. Finally, we want to thank all of you, our guests, for your support and for being here tonight. Our work would not be possible without the participation of hundreds of donors and volunteers each year. In a short time, we will bring you our featured speakers, best-selling author Francisco Cantu, uh, in conversation with Ali Narani of the National Immigration Forum. But first, we'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about the work we've done over the past year during the pandemic, after which we invite you to enthusiastically join us in a paddle raise in support of our cause. As everyone here is surely aware, immigration has become an incredibly divisive issue in recent years. Tonight, we brought together Francisco and Ali to help open our eyes and broaden our understanding on the hum of the human tragedy that takes place every day on our southern border. English in Action's work is a powerful counterpoint to that tragedy. We firmly believe that the more connected we are with our fellow human beings, the stronger we are, and that immigrants are an essential and vital part of our community. Your presence here this evening is a gesture of friendship and hope. At English in Action, we help adults learn English, English by matching them with volunteer tours one and one in the small groups because it opens doors in our community and helps immigrants to succeed personally and professionally. It certainly has for me. We also build relationships between community members who might not become friends otherwise. When we know each other, it is more difficult to demonize one another. Finally, we create opportunities for immigrants to become leaders in our valley and share their knowledge and talents. Now we'd like to share a short video about the work we've been doing throughout the pandemic in support of our adult students helping them continue to learn English and bridging the digital divide. My student has come a long way since we started working together. We are good friends and we've met each other's families. This is a celebration of so many people like her. The English in Action is a wonderful institution, no? Always uh, the people help me, always and other person. English in Action helped me to speak English because when I came here, I no speak nothing English. And now I speak a little English, <laughs> yeah. English in Action was founded in 1994 as a program of the Basalt Regional Library. What we do is we match volunteer tutors with adults who would like to learn English. We do that one-on-one. -on -one. We do it in small groups. Annually, we serve nearly 400 students through our programs with the help of 300 or more volunteer tutors. My tutor is very, very good. My family, and Vision Action is my family. Yeah, it's other family. <laughs> English in Action is much more than an organization that just teaches English. 
We create connections and friendships between people who might not meet otherwise. Those include doing things like going to Theater Aspen, going snowshoeing on Aspen Mountain. We also offer our Immigrant Voices Storytelling event. Our students and our tutors come together in new ways and celebrating our students' picnic, which we do every year, is one of the ways that we do that. Everybody in English and Action, they do a great job to help you improve your uh, language so you can uh, fit in with the community much better and uh, participate in a, in a lot of different things so that I struggle that much. At English in Action, we always relied on making connections between people in person, one-on-one -on -one in small groups. Uh, that was fundamental to how we operated. All of that had to change with the pandemic. Um, we could no longer meet in person in the way that we had in the past. Everyone was navigating dramatic changes in their lives. There was a lot of worry about what COVID-19 would mean to the community. We learned that nearly 70% of our students lost their jobs um, almost immediately. We were particularly concerned about what that would mean for them in terms of finances, in terms of food, and in terms of mental health. Very difficult for me. And my work is start for March the 18th. E next, the process the cancer. When pandemic is coming, I think it's so bad. And I care. I'm alone, yeah. All my family not, not come to visit. Nobody, she's alone. Our staff reached out to all of our students and our tutors. And one of the things that we learned was that people um, didn't know where to go to get support. English in Action has always been a resource for our students, but that needed to become an even larger part of what we did um, as an organization. English in Action always have present. The people, the English in Action always talk with me. Uh, they ask if I'm good, if need something. I feel very, very, very comfort. The Sara, eh, Angela, eh, Rocio. I, I have the the car for you for food. E, wow, it's very great. It's very great. When it became clear that the pandemic was not going to be short-lived, um, we realized that we needed to make adjustments to our programming. Um, it was still crucial for our students to continue learning English. Our staff moved quickly to learn how to support our tutoring pairs in meeting online. We changed all of our trainings to an online format for our tutors, and we moved our small group tutoring classes and our open hours conversation practice to an online format. The person is a uh, sofa. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a sofa. I didn't know soon till I started a these um, classes with Polly um, long distance. Well, and I got help yeah. from English in Action because uh -huh. I didn't know Zoom, but I was volunteering for open hours. So on Thursdays, you know, it just took a little practice. Some of our tutoring pairs were able to easily make the shift to online learning, but for others, that was more of a challenge. It is a new, it's a new language 
for sure. The computer is a new language. Uh, right now, you go to the doctor, they'll help you a little bit, but they hand you a tablet that you check in. You have to do the, everything. You name your address, uh, who you've seen, what have you seen, and everything. We conducted a survey last winter of our students, and we found that only about 25% of our students had access to a computer or a laptop in their home. It was discovered that the connection at that time was primarily on phones. And their entire world is a cell phone, and their view is a cell phone, and so teachers weren't able to use whiteboard tools the way they can in, when they're meeting in person or other online assets to help the student learn. Uh, and it was a real limitation. It became clear that adequate hardware, uh, adequate a computer or a tablet to fully participate in all of the educational opportunities was not a nice to have thing. It was, it was crucial. After we completed our survey of our students, we launched a digital equity and literacy program and Paulina Navas, one of our students, was hired to be our digital literacy coach. Once we had our coach in place, we acquired 50 tablets and 50 laptops and immediately started to schedule classes and sessions. Helena Navis is one of our advanced students, and she was an industrial engineer in Colombia. It was wonderful to be able to use her expertise in technology in order to support um, all of our students in their learning process. Some of the things that I am teaching in the digital literacy class is about to keep the students connect online in different ways, not just for learning English with their tutors. It's also to connect our students with their day-to-day -day life. So they are learning about how they feel in a PDF or how they could send or answer an email. Technology is for me an adventure. Uh, it helped me for learning more English. Yeah, the computer helped me. I learn more vocabulary, yeah. yeah. If I learn more vocabulary, I can speak more English. This digital literacy program will make a huge difference for our students. Um, it will open doors for them. It will increase their job prospects, and it will help them um, continue learning English. The shift to virtual learning is allowing us to expand what we offer to our participants by being able to connect people both in our traditional format as well as in virtual formats. Blessing, blessing uh, the person, the donation I play for me, the, the me, for the person, yeah, thank you. I'm uh, pretty sure it's gonna open me a lot of opportunities, learning the computer, <laughs> and uh, English and action has been great for me. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Paulina, for your help, everything. Thank you so much for English in Action, thank you. This organization is uh, beautiful. Oof, made me cry. In 2019, I was a student speaker at our summer benefit at the Hotel Jerome. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's student speaker, Paulina Navas. Paulina, Paulina joined us as a student in 2017 when she moved to the Roaring Fort Ballet from Colombia. 
English in Action recently hired Paulina as our digital literacy coach, and she is in charge of our, our new digital equity and literacy program. It's your Paulina. It's your turn. Okay. In thinking about what I wanted to say tonight, I'm sorry, I'm, I know. <laughs> I came across a quote from Mother Teresa. We ourselves think that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. There are so many stories I would like to tell you. And one of them is about my first meetings with my tutor Betsy Key. Uh, we used to meet at the Aspen Library, and I remember once she walked me to the bus stop, and I said goodbye energetically with a big hug of gratitude uh, in the Colombian style, and I noticed she, was, she had, had been surprised, and I said with my little English vocabulary that I had, uh, it is the way that we say goodbye in Colombia. <laughs> Since then, we have created an unforgettable relationship that has been going on for more than four years, and we are going for more. <laughs> I was born in Bogota, Colombia. I studied industrial engineering. I, I, I live there, as I do now, with my husband, John Lopez. Uh, we have a good life there but our life changed drastically due to security issues around John's work as an engineer and auditor. We had to leave our country and start our lives from scratch, including the language, in a country where we did not know a single person. Um, the first months, were full of surprises, new experiences and learnings, but above all, a lot of loneliness. Then we found a new home in English in Action. They gave us so much love, um, the ki kindness, and the most important, the opportunity to feel part of the community. I also remember my first time in English in Action office. Um, Sarah Kelly was there, and she asked me, do you want your tutor to know some Spanish? And I answered her without responding, no, I want to learn English. <laughs> and she asked me, uh, how are you going to communicate with her? And I said, I don't know, but I will find a way to do it. Um, apparently, we have succeeded, Betsy, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Betsy, for all your love, your understanding, and your patience. And thanks also to David Floria and John Fullerton for all, your, for, for all their teachings, their love, and their trust. And to all people that have been involved in our process to adapting and learning this new language. Without you, I, I would not be here speaking, so call me like that. <laughs> my, my husband and I um, consider ourselves very fortunate people to be able to share our lives with our tutors. Our tutors are not only our counselors or mentors. Our tutors have been and will be our friends and in effect, our USA-based parents. <laughs> as well as the language, um, they are the ones who have helped us grow 
to understand the culture and the history of this country. They have opened the doors of their homes, but especially the doors of their hearts. Clearly, we are still learning English with them. And thanks to the guidance to John Fullerton, we have also been developing a tool to help other people learn English. Now, after more than four years of learning and adapting to the culture, I have the privilege of working for English in Action as the coach for their new digital literacy program. The digital literacy program is a, is a project that I am joining, and in the five months that I have been involved, I have learned a lot from everyone. And I, I have even remembered what my mother and my father instilled in me. Persevere, Paulina. Never stop learning and serving. As an example of perseverance, I had able to see it in the older students excited to know about computers. For some, it's the first time that they have any contact with the technology. For others, is the beginning of the realization of their dreams. Their dreams to learn new, two new languages. Not only English, but also the, um, the language of the technology. Some have the dreams to have the, their own bilingual YouTube channel. Others simply want to be in contact with their tutors or their family using a technological tool. I can only tell you that together we can do really impressive things and we can put our own drop in this great ocean of love that Mother Teresa spoke about. I have not managed to do great things yet but what I have done has been with all my love. Thank you. is our community. Paulina's story sorry, is living proof. And on that note, <laughs> please welcome our panel raise auctioneer, <laughs> Lane Johnson, who is generously donating his time tonight. Lane has been an MC and volunteer for numerous uh, nonprofits in the Valley, and we are so grateful for his energy, his time, and his commitment to our cause. We promise this will be short. Thanks, Lane. Thank you so much. How's everybody doing? So nice to see so many beautiful faces out there to see all you guys. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Lane Johnson, and I'm honored to be here, frankly, to help support this amazing program. And we're going to raise some money really quick with your help. Um, you know, we all know that immigrants in the Roaring Fork Valley are truly the backbone. Um, in this program, you see what they've done, and you know what they're going to do. So let's help them out right now Make, and, and raise some money. Sound good? All right. So if, if you see in front of you, everyone has your, your card. Does anyone not have one of those? Okay, let me just see him really quick. If you could just, everyone hold them up in the air so I can see them. 
Within your program, you have a, another sheet, um, and that kind of outlines what your money can do for English in action. So you have an idea. All right. So I ask you for 30 seconds, take a second and think about what you can offer tonight to help this program. And we're going to get it going, all right? Um, we also have to thank quickly everyone that, who has already donated, our underwriters, our sponsors. Thank you very much. Um, and by the end of the night, hopefully everyone can donate in some shape, form, or fashion. Everything is appreciated. And thank you for just being here. Um, all right. We're going to get this thing going. We will start tonight's paddle raise at the $25,000 level. This is a big gift for English in Action. Only one other donor in the history of this fundraiser has ever done this. And we're going to ask if there's someone out there that can step up and meet that $25,000 pledge. Yes! 117! Thank you! 38! Thank you! 71! Thank you! 117 again! Two times! Wow! Holy cow! Anyone else for that $25,000 number? Just to let you know, what does $25,000 do for English in Action? 30 students can participate in the English in Action's dig digital equity and literacy program to supply computers. So Paulina can teach them how to use them and help our community. So one more time, 25,000, anyone else out there? Thank you so much. That's big time. Our next number is 15,000. 15,000 does a lot. It helps fund recruitment, training, support for 30 new tutors. It could help 15 students participate in our digital literacy program. $15,000, let's see some, there we go, 31, thank you. 29, thank you. Anyone else, $15,000. Thank you guys so much. We're going back down to the 10. Leadership training for advanced students, $10,000. 57, thank you, sir. 43, 50, 16, thank you. This is fun. 50, 50. thank you all so much. Any more, 10,000, thank you. $5,000, $5,000 underwrites a semester of a small group tutoring for 20 students. $5,000, anyone out there? Thank you so much, 32, 126, thank you. 102, 94, 68, thank you so much. $5,000, 145, thank you. Anyone else, 5,000. 33, thank you so much. $5,000, you guys are doing great. All right, 2,500. 2,500 covers our Immigrant Voices Storytelling Workshops. This includes our Immigrant Voices event where students and community members get up front and tell their story. It's an amazing event. So $2,500 can support this. 119, thank you. 76, 61, Mr. 70 right here. 35, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so sorry. 76, thank you so much. All right, $1,000. $1,000 adopts a student tutor pair. $1,000 would be amazing from everyone. Thank you so much. 10. 21, 13, 24, thank you. 
139, 155, 132, 129, thank you, 44, 122, 87, 89, 58, 73, let's go, 79, 95, excuse me, 97, 95. Oh man, thank you all so much. All right, $500. $500 de delivers a two hour pronunciation workshop. $500, anyone? I know everyone's probably already gone, but thank you. 123, 121, 114, 116, 37, 130, 105, 127, 136. Thank you so much. Am I missing anyone? Thank you guys so much. Oh, wow. 125, 100. Excuse me, $250, $250. So excited. Uh, $250 pays for our community activities for students and tutors. $250, thank you so much. $151, $143, $12, $144, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $
Ali Narani is the CEO and president of the National Immigration Forum, a Washington-based nonpartisan advocacy organization that brings together faith, law enforcement, and business leaders to promote the value of immigrants and immigration. He was our featured speaker at our virtual benefit last year, and we are thrilled to have him here in person this year. <laughs> Ali's podcast, Only in America, and his book, uh, There Goes the Neighborhood, How Communities Overcome Prejudice and Meet the Challenge of American Immigration, are both essential resources for those seeking to understand immigration in the United States. So, Francisco and Ali, please take the stage. Is this a one mic interview? I just ask all the questions and you're, you're, you're right. <laughs> Anybody see a mic around here? No. Oh. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so, so much for, for having both of us to speak, speak on behalf of Francisco for a hot second. And I also just really want to uh, thank this room for such incredible generosity. I mean, that was uh, pretty, that was just remarkable, but I think it was a real testament to the community that has been built through English in Action, not just through the donation, but through the real relationships that each person in this room has built with the community. And I, I can't remember who I was talking to earlier, but a board member, and she said, she, had, she put it a really powerful way. She said, English uh, it, 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 in language connects this valley in such a, an amazing way. So I just wanted to start with a thank you. Um, I also wanted to echo what Lara said, and just uh, uh, hats off to the amazing uh, staff of, the, the, of English in Action. And just, just, I cannot recommend this book enough. Um, I have the unfortunate privilege of reading a lot of immigration books, um, and this is easily one of the best ones that I have read, and I just really, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't, could not recommend it more. So, um, how are you? Good, thank Good. you for Good. saying all those kind <laughs> things about my book. And it really was thrilling to watch that uh, auction. I've never been in the room during something like that. Thank you all for, yeah. So, um, you know, as I was, sitting and watching the program and listening to uh, the speakers, you know, I realize that this is a conversation about people. And, you know, when you pick up Francisco's book, you often think about border and you think about policy. But the book that you wrote ultimately was about people. So to start the conversation, I wondered if you could talk about the three types of people that you talked, that you wrote about. The migrant, the border agent, but then also the, the, the smuggler. Wow, what a great question. I've never thought about um, those sort of three categories. Um, wow, the first question you asked is one of Right out of the gates. Asked. We're coming out hot. I mean, I mean we, have to, we have to keep yeah. up with an auction. I mean, that thing was so amazing. This book came out a while ago. I feel like I've answered every question, but I haven't had that one before. <laughs> um, you know, I think what's interesting is... Uh, the ways you know to sort of connect your question uh, back to the issue of policy, you know, policy is in you know a very long circuitous roundabout way what has brought all of those categories of people to the border. I mean, when you think about the border, I, I, I grew up in Arizona, um, so I grew up you know close to the desert, and uh, you know with with a real sense of the place. My mother was a, a, a park ranger for the National Park Service, and the first Several years of my life, I lived, you know, with a mom who tells stories about the outdoors uh, for a living. We're going to get to your mom in a minute. Oh, so okay. I won't give away too much about that. Don't jump ahead here. But you know, so so coming to coming to a place like the Sonoran Desert, the Arizona Desert, um, and you know, being in really remote terrain where people, you know, really shouldn't be, and people, you know, I think a lot of us forget that, you know, three decades ago people were not crossing through the middle of nowhere in the Sonoran Desert, in the Arizona borderlands, right? Um, people were primarily passing through towns and cities. Um, but, you know, it was policy change that uh, came about in the late 80s and the, in the early 1990s that completely shifted the way people move across borders. 
Um, and, you know, by building, actually, the, you know, we, we feel like build a wall is sort of a new thing. Um, maybe a lot of us in this room feel like it's a ridiculous thing, but it's been around for a long time. Um, and the first calls to build the wall, right, they started um, in, you know, places like El Paso, San Diego, some of the busiest border crossings along the southern border. Um, and, you know, it was uh, the first walls that were built were in the 80s and in the 90s, and it started to push people outside of towns and cities, um, which was kind of the idea, right, to get it out of the, the view of the sort of angry voter, um, to, you know, for politicians to, you know, be able to cover, cover themselves a little bit. Um, and that's why you started having people cross out in, you know, the remote mountains. Um, and that's when you started to see border deaths, like, really climb. Like, people, um, there were not significant numbers of border deaths um, before these policies were instituted. Um, and so I think, you know, when you think about smugglers, when you think about migrants, um, and uh, you think about border agents out in the middle of nowhere, that's why they're there. Um, and I think it's really, you know, it, it seems, it can kind of seem like an antiquated piece of history, but as we think about, um, you know, where we want to push policy um, in, you know, the, the coming years, uh, I, I think it's really important to be thinking about how we have sort of weaponized the desert and made that journey not just more dangerous at the border, but dangerous in Mexico, in Guatemala, the border between Guatemala and Mexico, El Salvador, et cetera, et cetera. All of these borders are becoming more and more policed, you know, following that same model. So you bring up the, the idea of weaponization. And, you know, I think really since, you know, most recently since the 2013 Syrian refugee crisis, we've seen the, the weaponization of global migration. And you speak very, and you write very specifically about the weaponization of borders. Um, so... When you, as you see kind of border policy moving forward over time, is, there, is it even possible to, to walk that back, mm -hmm. to, to kind of take away the ability of borders to be weaponized in a political way that leads to, you know, I would argue, really a weakening of democracy in a lot of ways? You know, I think it, I think it is uh, possible to, to walk it back, but, you know, all of the things that we're talking about, they've been normalized over the course of, you know, decades. Um, and they've been normalized under administrations of both, of both parties, right? Um, and so I think, yeah, when you, when you think about um, the border as it looks in the Mediterranean, for example, um, you sort of recognize that, that any landscape um, has the potential to be weaponized in this way, right? Like when, um, when you know, migrants die on the journey from North Africa to Europe, that looks like a boat capsizing in the middle of the Mediterranean, and then you know instantly, 800 people drown. Um, and and so you know we have to, you know, if if you think about walking something like that back, actually in a really interesting way, um, if you look at border numbers um, in the last two three years, um, the number of you know the 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 population of who's migrating has completely changed. When I was in the border patrol, still it was primarily um, you know, male economic labor migrants, right? They would be called by an academic. Um, so, you know, people looking, uh, you know, for, for work in the United States or possibly like joining family. Um, and, you know, not families uh, like, like we see now. Um, and not, as, not asylum seekers in the huge numbers that we see now. And if you look at the, the numbers as they've shifted over the last couple of years, you actually see that, um, you know, I, I think a majority of people who are, at least in Arizona, presenting themselves at the border, they're actually coming to a port of entry as prescribed by law um, and, and asking for asylum. Um, so they're, they're actually coming the correct way, right? Like this is the legal way when everybody is like, oh, you know, get in line, come the way you're supposed to. That is the way you're supposed to. Or at least the, that's the only legal pathway that really exists. Right, and that's, that's all that's sort of left. And so you've seen the population completely change. And what you see now is that, um, you know, in part because of some pr um, policies of the previous administration and in part because of COVID, um, well, both of those things compounded, 
um, you know, people are unable to uh, partake in that process. So you have people now, asylum seekers, families, women with their children, um, walking around again out into the middle of the desert and, you know, flagging down border patrol agents because they can't get in at the port of entry. Um, and so, you know, you see that like this, we, we, we could not have these people out in the desert already by, by that sort of natural shifting of demographics. And so, of course, it's possible, but, um, you know, we have uh, big, powerful institutions that are getting, you know, m millions and billions of dollars in the federal budget every year to police the border the way it's been policed for decades. And so, you know, that's going to continue um, in, until, you know, the political incentives change. So one of the things that I really like about the book is that it's, it's deeply personal. Um, and one of the people we get to know through the book is your mom. Do you ever mention her name? Uh, I don't think I read. I don't think you I, do. I leave a lot of names out, but her name is Rita. Okay. So how's Rita? <laughs> she's she's doing great. Good. I feel yeah. like I know her. She um, called me the other she called me the other day, and she was like, "You're speaking in Aspen. That's wonderful. I saw that it's a sold out crowd." I was, I was like, "I had nothing to do with the sold out crowd, but that, mom mom has like a Google alert whenever yeah, it pops up." <laughs> um, so I guess my question is is you know what led you to decide to join what is the largest federal law enforcement agency? in the country, which is the Border, border Patrol, uh, Customs and Border Protection. And then, you know, you write about this so powerfully in the c ongoing conversation with your mom as you grapple with, um, and I think you, you, you write about this briefly, the, the moral injury of border policy. That's a great question. Um, you know, I joined the Border Patrol fresh out of college. So um, as, a, as a young, and somewhat naive person. I really joined the Border Patrol um, imagining that, you know, I studied immigration in college, uh, studied US-Mexico relations, and I thought, um, having grown up in Arizona, okay, you know, like, this is gonna be a way to see the reality on the ground in a really powerful and unique way. And I thought, oh, great, I'll, I'll go on to become an immigration lawyer and I'll have all this experience that nobody else has. And I also thought, as a young person, and I think this is important, it's something I've only really realized um, in the last few years, and it relates to the kinds of stories that we tell in this country and the stories that we pass on to, you know, uh, young, young people and young generations, you know, like all the movies that we watch, it's in the, uh, the bloodstream of the stories we tell here, is, uh, you know, one individual entering an institution and against all odds, you know, changing the culture or changing um, how people think. And, and you know, we, we, we put an enormous weight on the individual, the power of the individual to change things in this country. Um, and, you know, my experience, you know, I, I, I went in with that idea, like, oh, I'll be able to, you know, be a force for good from the inside, help change things, come out with all of these sort of answers. And, and my experience was really being humbled by sort of the, the, the fearsome, power of, you know, in these institutions, these institutions that have been, um, you know, uh, functioning very well for a long time, despite the ambitions of a lot of individuals um, who might seek to change them. And, and so, you know, my, my experience in the Border Patrol and, and then, you know, years now having left it is amazing to watch the power that we actually have in rooms like this to affect change as parts of communities, right? And um, building relationships. And, um, you know, if you actually look at the history of, um, you know, policy, uh, policing, um, you know, and the, the, the way that institutions of power function, they almost never change from within, right? We have to, rec we have to grapple with that story as being one that um, is sort of rooted in some fallacy and that we actually have a lot more power sitting around a table like this, um, creating a relationship like so many of you have created with, you know, tutors or your, um, you know, teaching, and 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 a lot of times that is what leads to a political awakening and kind of like a cultural shift. So at the end of the book, uh, I would say the last quarter of the book, you you bring in the story of Jose, uh, and this is when you left the border patrol. Sounds like you're in graduate school this time. Um, and you meet Jose and, you know, just to, you know, to give you the, this is not a spoiler alert because you should still buy the book. Uh, um, <laughs> but it sort of is. Uh, but you should still buy the book. But in any case, Jose, um, Paco gets to know him. 
Jose has to go back to Mexico to, to, to see his dying mother, but he can't get back across the border. Um, so I guess my question here is, because you, you end up helping Jose mm. in a lot of different ways, and his family. Mm. Um, was this you seeking redemption in some way? Yeah, I think it's interesting you mentioned Jose's mother. I realized that I sort of dodged your question about my mom. I went on a completely, totally different yes. tangent. <laughs> That's probably, uh, psychologists would have something to say about that. But, um, you know, I think... The, the reason I went off on that tangent is my mother was the one who I think, uh, you know, mothers have an, an instinct for, you know, when their children are entering into danger or like maybe in over their head. And so I think that, um, you know, as a young person, I, I, I definitely overestimated um, what I had, you know, the power to change or be part of. And so, you know, to answer your question, see, having a relationship with someone like Jose after after leaving the Border Patrol, um, I think really distilled like these huge system-wide, um, you know, actually, if you think about relationships with individuals, you know, in, in, in the first part of the book, um, I write a lot about just like day after day, um, you know, uh, bringing somebody in to be deported from the field, right? Like picking someone up in the desert. But and letting the drug smugglers go. <laughs> but which I, I didn't. I yeah. didn't do that. Oh, no, well, but, yeah, but, yeah. But, right, right, yeah. We were trained to do that. Yeah. Um, you'll have to read the book to understand that. Um, but you know, the the kinds of conversations. There's like an accumulation of of individual conversations with border crossers that that I had that made you know over the over a long period of time made a really big impression on me. Um, but those were short interactions. Um, you know, that, that were bound by the confines of the institutional roles that like both of us were in, specifically me in a position of power. And so um, the relationship with Jose, as somebody who was undocumented, who I created a friendship with outside of the confines of, you know, after leaving this job behind me, um, and then watching that person slip into the sort of the jaws of that institution, and, and then because I had a close friendship and personal relationship with him, then understanding you know, that, that those stakes were the same stakes for every single individual that I met you know, briefly um, one day after the next in my prior job. And so um, you know, that's, that's why the book really spends a lot of time with Jose's story because Jose's story is, is not unique, um, which, is, which is hard to say because we like to think that you know, everyone that we meet has a unique story, but Jose's story um, is, is the story of so many migrants um, in this country. And, um, you know, what, what made all the difference was having a relationship with that person. Um, and, and then you begin to understand the stakes of the policies that when you're reading headlines in newspaper or watching, um, you know, pundits talk on TV, it, it seems so abstract, um, but then it becomes personal. Kind of. So much of what we've heard tonight and the people we met this evening of the, the relationship between someone who's learning English and who is really trying to, uh, who's pursuing their American dream and seeking to live to their fullest potential and then the person helping them in that relationship. Um, so as you watch border policy unfold with this administration, you know, what runs through your mind, even though I know you hate kind of commenting on border policy? No, no. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to turn this question back around on you in just a second. So, um, I, you know, to me, the, the overarching, um, the thing that seems so important to me is that uh, I think, you know, everybody in this room probably um, started to pay attention to what was happening on the border in a di at a different level, in a different way over the, uh, the course of the last few years. I was actually in Aspen doing a residency um, for Aspen Words, um, you know, went during the summer of 2018 when the child separation crisis was happening. And, um, you know, aside from the, all the reasons that that was gutting, w what really struck me was how many people w started to pay attention and how many articles were coming out and how many headlines and just, you know, um, the engagement and the outrage. Um, 
And, and I think what's so important about this moment is that I think a lot of, a lot of people will be inclined to think that, you know, now that there's a new administration in the White House, that kind of like the work is done and that uh, things, uh, you know, like we can rest easy. Um, but that's really not the case. I mean, we, we, we've seen already just in the last few months a lot of Trump era policies that um, advocates um, were waiting, you know, just expecting would be overturned and kind of be yesterday's news. You know, they're getting renewed um, and uh, continued under uh, the new administration. And so, you know, a lot of that is, is about engagement. Um, you know, we also see there's so much vying for our attention and for the news headlines, but we have to pay, we have to keep paying attention at the same level to what's happening on the border and to the stories of, you know, just all the migrants who are coming here. Um, because, you know, the, the moment we stop paying attention is the moment that those, uh, you know, sort of policies and structures, you know, they become reinforced and solidified. And something that I wanted to ask you about this is, um, you know, reading your book, there was so many moments, and, and this is also a book that you should buy. <laughs> um, there goes the neighborhood. Um, and read, reading your book, like, you, you had so much courage to step into so many rooms with so many people who are on, uh, uh, you know, the opposite side of the political spectrum for you. And this was something, especially reading right, right now, that I think, you know, we, we're all, uh, a lot of us have become allergic to. Um, and, and it seems terrifying. It seems terrifying to me in, in a way that it didn't seem before. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of have the same question for you as somebody who has, um, you know, showed up so many times and sat down at the table with, you know, council members, um, pastors, um, organizations like this one, you know, bringing a lot of people from, with diverse interests and, you know, kind of divided um, outlooks. How, you know, like what lessons have you learned that we can take um, and into sort of like coalition building, shifting dialogue? All that kind of thing. Well, look, who's asking the questions here? Um, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, um, so I, I guess, thank you, first, first of all. Um, you know, for us uh, at the National Immigration Forum, to make a long story short, in 2010, we decided that um, we were going to focus the majority of our resources on the engagement of conservative and moderate faith law enforcement and business leaders. Because, frankly, we figured that if we're going to pass legislation, we've got to figure out a way to bring new voices and new allies into the conversation. And it's kind of as simple as, you know, our motto, our informal motto, if you will, as an organization is to meet people where they are, but don't leave them there. Uh, and what that means in practice often is a lot of awkward conversations. Um, but it also means that as an individual, as an organization, as an incredible team of staff that I am lucky to work with, is that, you know, there's, we've developed an ability to sit with that tension and un really try to understand what are somebody's fears, what are their concerns, and then to be able to address those fears and concerns, uh, whether it's through you know, a faith forward conversation with a pastor or with a, a local uh, police chief or, or sheriff, or even from an economic perspective with a small business owner. And um, you know, our, our kind of our value proposition is that if you hold a Bible, you wear a badge, or you own a business, you want a common sense solution to the, the immigration system. Um, so it's, you know, it's probably the most interesting thing I'll ever do uh, in terms of being able to, to have these conversations and kind of begin to understand, okay, what's the, the, common, the common thread? Um, so we've got questions also from the room, right? What time would we like to go to those? Right now? Now. <laughs> I like that. Question in the audience. Hi there, Anne O'Brien. Super fast question. Uh, maybe both of you could collaborate. Maybe it's more for Ali. But if you could tell us now your construct of the perfect new immigration policy, putting to the side, putting to the side, you know, the 11 or whatever million immigrants that are here that they would have some path to the citizenship. So let's just presume that. What would be your other three or four key essential parts of that policy? Thank you. 
Um, well, sure. So um, earlier this year, uh, my colleague Danilo Zach and I wrote a paper. Actually, he wrote the paper. He was nice enough to allow me to put my name on it. Um, because it's a smart paper, it's a really, really good paper. Um, but it's called Room to Grow. And for the first time as an organization, we made the case of this is the number of people we need to have in the nation. So what we did is we looked at the old age dependency ratio. In essence, the ratio of working age adults to retirees. Back in the mid-1960s, that number was over 6.5 working age adults to retirees. Now that number is about 3.54. So it's on the downslope. So we extrapolated from there, and we asked a pretty basic question. If we keep immigration where we are now, which is roughly a million people, give or take, in a particular year, particular administration, that number will continue to go down. And that's against the backstop of 2034, where the Social Security system will be, quote, depleted. So 2034 is around the corner. So then we asked the question, okay, in order just to maintain 3.54, how much do you need to increase immigration? And we didn't get into the different visa classifications or anything like that. We just said raw number. The raw number is that we, need, we as a nation need to increase immigration to the United States 37%. About, three, about 370,000 people, which is not a lot of people, right? In a country of, what are we, 330 million people now? So, I think that's the core of a functioning immigration policy moving forward. But in many ways, that's also probably the most difficult part of the debate right now. Because I think that under the previous administration, we've really seen a, a decrease in support for the future of immigration writ large. Um, so how do we relitigate this case? But then we just, it's not just about you know, economic facts and figures. It's really about helping people at a very local level see what their self-interest is in an increase in immigration. Um, and that's going to be different between Carbondale and Aspen, between, you know, Colorado Springs and Carbondale. So we're really trying to understand those challenges. And I think if we can change that narrative, change that conversation against that number, then you can actually have a set of policy uh, proposals that have the chance of seeing the light of day. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And Daniel? Go ahead. We both A um, couple of questions. I'm not going to stay. Um, first of all, given the current worker shortage, do you think this has a potential to change attitudes for the better going, for, going forward if, if this doesn't resolve itself and all over the country? And number two, how do you think the pending influx of refugees from Afghanistan is going to affect immigration? Not so much policy, but, ad but attitudes in this country. Um, so the, the first question, in terms of um, the current worker shortage, I think yes, to a certain degree, because it, 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 it starts to shift to the conversation, right? And people business owners and folks who are pursuing, who need services or just going to a store or a restaurant, they're beginning to ask that question. Um, but without an overarching story about American immigration, um, we're, we're kind of not taking advantage of the moment. And that's my fear right now, is that there's a lot of talk about worker shortages, but there's not really a lot of talk about, okay, how, what does this mean kind of long term over the next 10 years? Um, and, you know, frankly, I. I think that the president has an incredible opportunity here that he's not taking advantage of, quite frankly. Um, and I would argue that a lot of your conversations on the Hill right now are very, they're almost too focused. Um, yes, I believe we should pass, you know, legalize dreamers, we should legalize farm workers and you know, address that part of the system, but there's a bigger story to tell here, which gets me to the Afghan uh, refugee question. Um, you know, and I, I, I can't remember who I was talking to earlier, um, but, it is one of the things, I mean, when you work in immigration, there are a lot of things that really anger you. And you know, I've worked in it long enough where I can kind of like hold that stuff in. I am pissed about the way that we as a nation have treated our Afghan allies who helped our military in the US. But I'm also incredibly pissed that politically we have failed to understand the opportunity here. Um, and I can kind of speak about what the, 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 the solutions are, or the, the policy solutions, but I think more importantly, I think as, you know, 
it's been a remarkable three weeks, just in terms of what we've seen in Kabul, what we've seen around the world. But, you know, in the week after the evacuation started, over 70% of Republicans, over 70% of Republican voters supported the resettlement of Afghan allies. Over the weekend, there was a New York Times article which cited a um, evangelical uh, church, one of the largest evangelical churches in Phoenix, um, and how they were welcoming refugees. In fact, as a side note, we helped kind of put the pieces of that story together. In that story, 59% of Republicans support the resettlement of Afghan allies. So this is the opportunity in this awful, terrible crisis, is that we can tell this new story about the value of our asylum system, the value of our immigration system, and just the importance of protecting people. And that, in essence, is kind of the core of you know, who we should be as a country. But you know, that means that there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, um, across you know, the broad civic society to, to move that forward. I just want to add one more thing to the, the conversation about Afghanistan, just because um, I think there's a sense among people of, of both parties, you know, who've lived through this, this long war um, of, you know, sort of like the debt that we owe people who um, have been involved in sort of like a, a war that was not of their own making. Um, and, and I think like it's important to sort of connect with and like root down in that empathy that we feel in this moment. And, and remember that like it actually applies to a lot of other countries that are sending large numbers of migrants here. Um, you know, especially in Central America. If you look at, um, you know, the, the Civil War in Guatemala, um, you know, the, in, in the 80s, um, all of the, the, the conflicts in El Salvador and in Nicaragua. And these are countries that are sending, you know, that for the, for the past few years have actually overtaken Mexico as the countries that are sending um, the, the highest number of migrants. And, you know, our, uh, our sort of, meddling or intervention or foreign policy or whatever you want to call it is is deeply tied to the reasons and the instability that has created um, that flow of people as well and so I think it's it's important in, in, in moments like this when when we can recognize it so clearly it's important to recognize it in the cases where it's not quite as clear we have time for probably one more question anybody have something burning we have, okay, all the way over there and I'm in heels. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Thank you. He's meeting me halfway. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Austin. Thank you so much. Um, Paco, this is more of a question for you. I wanted to ask about um, border communities. Uh, you mentioned that the policy changes in the 80s and 90s that allowed for the weaponization of deserts came from communities, I think you mentioned in El Paso and San Diego who wanted walls on the border, maybe I'm uh, understanding that incorrectly, but I wanted to ask how, what is the line that we have to walk between considering the interests of migrants and considering the interests of the country, and then also considering the interests, which are probably slightly more complicated, of the communities on the border that are being affected most intimately? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and and I think um, just, just to sort of clarify uh, my sort of like super quick rough uh, summary of, of that history. I, th I think it's important to note that, you know, it's not necessarily the people in those communities who might have been calling for uh, walls or like, you know, more, more policing necessarily. Um, I think that, you know, it was, was definitely like local leaders, politicians and law enforcement agencies that, that um, you know, responded to concerns with, um, a solution of walls, right? I think a lot of people wouldn't have said that that's what they were asking for, um, but that's what they got. Um, and you know, I was I was recently in uh, Big Bend National Park, um, and this is uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. You know, in, in West Texas, that big part of the Rio Grande that curves um, to give you know Texas that crazy shape on the west side. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge national park there, there's protected areas on the Mexican side, and this is kind of like one of the, the, the last places on the desert that um, hasn't yet been, you know, completely altered by border militarization. Um, and, you know, if you look at the border statistics every year, uh, the Big Bend sector of the Border Patrol is the one that, you know, 
seizes the least amount of drugs and arrests the least amount of people. There's just not a lot of crossings in that area. Um, but in, in the last couple of, uh, you know, in the last year, in the last couple months, um, some of the people that I was talking to down there, they've, they've seen groups of migrants crossing. And, and, you know, a lot of them have said, they would say to me, you know, I, I do think that we probably need walls in places like El Paso, um, you know, where there's lots and lots of crossings. And, but I think what a lot of those people don't realize is that the reason people are now crossing in their backyard is because of those walls and because of that intense enforcement in the other places. So I think it's important to realize that, you know, we're really just exporting and moving our problem like placing a rock in the water, right? The, the answer, it's, it's not an, inf the, the, the answer is not more policing and law enforcement and militarization. The answer, like Ali is, is starting to articulate, it's a, it's a political answer, it's a policy answer. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the most difficult intractable in, in policy solutions. It's eluded us for decades. Um, and there's been this, you know, this, this stalemate and all sorts of bargains where, um, you know, people accept the status quo because it doesn't affect them, right? Like border communities don't have a huge voice in the United States Congress, right? Like we don't have a huge voice on the nightly news. Um, you know, when you look at like the rhetoric of the border, it's still very much like rooted in the old west, like frontier rhetoric. It's seen as sort of like the furthest reaches of our country. Um, and so I think, we, you know, we have to consider what the kind of policing and enforcement measures that happen on the border the same way that we would consider what if they were happening here, you know, like what if between Aspen and Basalt you had to go through a border patrol checkpoint? Um, and, and, you know, bring that kind of awareness to the sorts of policies that we're asking people to implement in communities that aren't our own. And, you know, listening to those border residents, um, because probably very few of them would have asked for a wall. Um, and, you know, I think, like Ali is saying, sitting down at the table and, like, actually um, not, not giving those people a voice, because uh, nobody gives somebody a voice, we all have voices, but actually, you know, hearing those people's voices. On that note, <laughs> thank you so much, Ali and Francisco. What a beautiful and enlightening. Thank you so much, and thank all of you. We're a few minutes over, and we really appreciate your time. Go ahead, Estella. Muchas gracias por venir esta noche. Thank you for coming tonight. Before you all go, we would like to let you know that we raised at least 250,000 dollars from a paddle race. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Thank you all for your generous donation to our paddle race. Please remember to pay on your way out, sending your checks or pay on our website. <laughs>